Hey guys, uh, here we are in section 2.2 of the um, AP curriculum. So we're still in the chemical context of life, but now we are looking at atoms and particularly at the concept that um, a particular element's atomic structure has an effect on its chemical behavior. And in order to talk about that, we got to talk about the atoms first. And so again, this should all be more or less review of something that you've done either this year or in the past in your chemistry classes or maybe in your general science classes. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it. Uh, so when we talk about atomic structure, uh, the first thing that we always talk about is subatomic structure. Yeah, oops, that's a good color. Um, and Oftentimes we'll talk about subatomic particles when we talk about um, atomic structure. And that is just a word that talks about the parts that make up an atom, right? So it's just a fancy word for parts of an atom. So when we look at an atom, it's made out of three components, which you should remember as, yeah, protons, <laughs> neutrons, and electrons, right? Um, so we have our protons and when we talk about um, subatomic particles, the parts of an atom, we always like to talk about their charge, what electrical charge they have, um, and their relative size, as well as their location in an atom. So here I have um, two different ways of drawing um, a representation of an atom. Um, this one here, oops, you are probably more familiar with. Um, where we represent the protons um, and the neutrons in the center in something that we call the nucleus. And the electrons are zooming around in a ring or on some kind of like a uh, energy level on the outside. Um, and there are things that are accurate about that, but there are also some things that are not. Um, like for example, this concept of electrons being in some kind of a ring or some kind of a track is not entirely accurate in terms of what electrons are actually doing. Um, and so we have this model over here, which is actually more accurate, where it represents the electrons as clouds. Um, and these are actually clouds of probability, where the electrons are likely to be. Um, and we're not really gonna get into that too much, but just know that when we draw these models here with the rings, these atomic, atomic models, um, we draw them because they are easier to draw than clouds um, and sometimes can be clearer, but they are not completely accurate, um, as most models are. In any case, um, going back to the subatomic particles, um, so we have our protons and they have a charge that is, yeah, positive, um, and our electrons have a charge that is negative. And you will remember that neutrons are neutral or have no overall charge, right? And our protons and our neutrons are found at the core, at the center of the atom, right? Um, in what we call the nucleus. And then we have our electrons and those are zooming around, not randomly, in very specific ways, uh, but they're zooming around on the outside of our atom. And I'll show you a video, a Bill Nye video, uh, that um, shows kind of the uh, positions of electrons um, in atoms. Uh, so we talked about the charge, we talked about the location, and now let's talk about the size. Um, so it turns out that protons and neutrons are quite large compared to electrons, and we can say that protons and neutrons both have a mass of about one Dalton, named after the dude that figure this stuff out, because that's how you do it in science. You name things after yourself when you figure things out. Um, and one Dalton is sometimes also um, called an atomic mass unit, which makes a lot more sense to me, if you ask me, or an AMU, right? So if you have one proton, it would be one Dalton. So this proton here that we have, I know it's a proton because it has a positive charge, is one AMU, right? And this neutron over here is also one. AMU, this proton here is one AMU, and this neutron here is one AMU. And so the total atomic um, mass of 
this uh, nucleus um, would be about four atomic mass units, right? So one, two, three, four. Um, and uh, there, there are a few terms here um, that we're going to go over uh, in, uh, as far as atomic mass and uh, mass numbers, but we'll get into that later. But for now, you should be familiar with these terms, atomic mass units and Daltons. Both of those could show up and they're fair game. Um, and you might be saying, well, Miss Michaela, what about the electrons? And the electrons are actually um, significantly smaller than the protons and the neutrons, even though when we draw them, we sometimes won't draw them um, that much smaller. Uh, but that's, again, uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity. Uh, but it turns out that an electron has a mass of about one two thousandth of a Dalton or an atomic mass unit. Um, so they are much, much, much smaller. And so when we talk about mass, um, oftentimes we kind of ignore their mass because they're so small, but you should know that they do have some mass. Um, we just don't take it into account because they're so small. So that is all I want to say here, I believe. Um, all right, so um, we talk about atomic numbers in chemistry and in biology. And the atomic number, right, is a number that we assign to uh, an element that tells us the number of protons that it has. So like here, if we look at helium, it has an atomic number of two. Oftentimes, the atomic number is written up at the top. And if it's not written on the top, um, it, I mean, it might be in some other position, might be underneath it. Um, but it's always a whole number, right? So when you look at the periodic table of elements, and it might be a little bit hard to see because this is quite small, um, you can see that they have some that are whole numbers, right? And some that are, are decimals. And what you need to remember is these whole numbers are your atomic numbers, and they tell you the number of protons. And you'll notice as you go from the left the table to the right, they increase by one, right? The number for boron is five, then we go to carbon, 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 and it's six, nitrogen is seven, oxygen is eight, and so forth, right? If we go to the next row over, I don't know if I can actually move here very easily, um, uh, then, you know, it, we see it increase as well by one. Um, so, Atomic number increases by one as you move from left to right of the table, and then you go to the next row, and it still keeps increasing. Um, so atomic number is pretty uh, useful uh, for figuring out the number of protons, but it actually helps you figure out also the number of electrons. Because you'll remember that um, an atom often has a neutral charge overall, and that means that it has a balanced number of protons and number of electrons, right? Because protons have our positive charges, electrons have our negative charges, and if those two are the same, then they balance each other out and they cancel each other out, right? And then we have our overall neutral charge. And I can take you to the um, FET simulator here to remind you of that, right? So the, again, remember atomic number is the number of protons, but it's also our number of electrons if we have a neutral atom. So here in the FET simulator, um, and I'll take you actually, let me take you there now. So if we go into Chrome, not that yet. So we have our simulator here, right? And so I made a carbon atom um, and I'm going to take away some electrons just for the sake of showing you. So this simulator, you should come back to it if you get a chance. Um, and you just type in uh, PHET and atom, and it'll be the first thing that pops up, and you just can open it. Um, so here I have uh, a simulation of an atom, and I chose to put uh, a total of six protons in the middle, right? So I have my six here, so that makes it carbon because the number of protons determines what element you have. 
And um, here you can see my net charge. So right now I have my one, two, three, four, five, six positive charges, which are coming from my protons. And I have um, my one, two, three, four negative charges, right? So I don't know if I lost you because I changed desktops. Um, so I'm going to try to explain that one more time um, from where I think I lost you. Um, and if I'm repeating myself, then I'm repeating myself. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay, um, so uh, we went to the FET simulator, um, and I was talking about how you can find this easily by going to PHET um, and Adam. If you Google that, then that will pop up and probably the first thing that comes up. Um, so we were talking about carbon, and we were saying that carbon has uh, six protons, and it's the number of protons that determines what uh, element we're talking about here. And so I put in my my six. Uh, shoot, that's a lot. I put in my uh, six protons. Um, I can take some away, and that would change my element, but I don't want to do that. Um, and I can see my six positive charges represented here with the pluses. Again, those are the protons because protons have a positive charge. Um, and I have four electrons right now. And as you can see, there is an overall imbalance of charge, right? I have an uh, abundance of positive charge um, and I need more negative charge to balance that out. And so since I have extra, uh, extra positive charge, my overall charge right now is positive two. And um, this is actually an ion, which you might remember uh, from chemistry, talking about ions, uh, but we're not getting into that too much right now. So if I wanted to balance out the charge, I would put the same number of electrons, and now I have a overall neutral atom, right? It's represented as an atom here, and my charge, my net charge, my overall charge is zero because I have six positive charges and I have six negative charges, um, which makes it zero. And maybe that was a bit long-winded, but that is why your atomic number tells you the number of protons and the number of electrons if we're talking about a neutral atom. That is not the case if we're talking about an ion, but we're not going to get into that right now. So going back to this guy, I don't think I've okay, I think we're still, I think we're still recording. Good. Um, so atomic number, really useful. Don't forget how useful it is. Don't mix it up with the atomic mass. Um, so if we move on now to the part that might get a little bit confusing, we're going to go on to mass number. So I think in your classes you have learned about atomic mass. But now I don't want you to confuse the idea of a mass number. The mass number simply is a number that tells you the number of protons you have and the number of neutrons you have. And this will become important when we talk about isotopes because we use the mass number to tell us how many neutrons we have. And if you're saying, wait, this is confusing, what are you talking about, iso what? Um, we will get there very soon. Um, and so we can represent elements in this form here um, where we have our chemical symbol written nice and big. and the atomic number can be written on the bottom as a subscript, and then we write the mass number up here as a superscript on the left side. And so this tells me that I have um, a hydrogen atom and, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's my little brother. Uh, we have a hydrogen atom, um, and it has an atomic number of one, meaning that it has one proton, right? And it must have one neutron because two minus one, right? So if we have our mass number is two, one, so what plus one makes two, it's one, right? Uh, so we have one neutron. So you can do that kind of math in your head. And a lot of people get confused by this, but just remember that the mass number is the sum of 
of protons and neutrons. And if you can remember that, then you should be able to do the math, um, even without a calculator. So that is the mass number. Now let's talk about the atomic mass. Um, so atomic mass is a number that is a decimal. Uh, and this decimal is a weighted average of the mass of um, the particular uh, element we're talking about, right? So our atomic mass right here for helium, for example, is uh, 4.003. And maybe you've asked yourself, why is it a decimal? And why does this decimal always seem like it's, you know, it just like goes on forever or like it's different in different tables? Um, and the reason for that has to do with the fact that we have something called isotopes. Um, and isotopes are versions, different versions of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons, right? And I have that on the next slide here for you to see. So don't get too excited about all the stuff with carbon yet. Um, take a look at this, what I have written up here. So different forms or versions of the same element, um, so they have the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. Um, does that mean that they'll have a different charge? No, right? Because neutrons have a charge of zero. So if you have more neutrons, it's not going to change your charge. If you have less neutrons, it's not going to change your charge. But it will change your mass. Your mass number will be different depending on the isotope. Um, and there's a lot of different isotopes depending on what element we're talking about, but let's talk about carbon, for example. So carbon, if you look at your periodic table, um, you will see that it uh, has six protons, hopefully you can remember that by now, um, and sometimes it has six neutrons, right? So I have that written in a number of places here, but you can look at this picture and you can see that there are six protons um, and that there are six neutrons, right? And so that means that it would have a mass of 12, right? Because each of those protons and each of those neutrons have a mass of about one, you add it all up, it's mass of 12, right? Pretty straightforward. Turns out, though, carbon can actually exist in a slightly different form, where it has, again, the same number of protons as before. It has those six protons, but this time it has seven neutrons. And I'm sorry, that's a little bit hard to see. There we go. Seven neutrons, right? And so if we add those together, that gives us 13, right? And so we see that this isotope, this form, this different form of carbon, has an atomic mass of 13. Turns out carbon just can be in a lot of different forms and it can actually exist in another form where again, it has six protons, otherwise it wouldn't be carbon, right? It's that, that number of protons that tells us that it's carbon, but it can have eight neutrons, right? And so again, if we add that up, that gives us 14. And so now we have an atomic mass of 14, right? And if I wanted to write this in the um, notation that I showed you before, I would write a C and I'd have the 14 and then I have a six down here. For this form here, I would do my big C for the symbol. I would make a nice little 13 here as a superscript and then a six as my subscript on the left. And for carbon 12, have my 12, the mass number as my superscript and the six as my subscript, even though it's kind of a funny looking six. Um, but it turns out that these different isotopes, these different forms, don't exist in the same amounts, right? So for carbon, most, almost 99% of carbon is carbon-12, okay? So the majority of the carbon that you come across in the world is carbon-12. Some approximately 1% of it is carbon-13, right? So if you had 100 carbon atoms, of that 100, about 99 of them would be carbon-12. They would have a mass of 12. 
and maybe one of them would have a mass of 13, right? And you might think, well, it's not really like, why would we even care? But it turns out that these isotopes can have very useful applications um, in science. Um, and of those hundred, um, even less than one, it's very unlikely, but there might be one um, carbon that has an atomic mass of 14. And those are very, 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 very rare. If you had a trillion um, carbon atoms, maybe one of them would be carbon-14. Um, but it turns out, even though carbon-14 is very, 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 very rare, it's very useful um, to uh, figuring out how old things are. And we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later. Um, so if you want for, um, yeah, might as well go into it. Uh, so you might be asking, so what about that atomic, that like average atomic mass? Um, so what you have to do there, and I don't think you need to do calculations like this on the exam, but it might be interesting for you to do. Um, what you do is you take the mass and you multiply it by its abundance, how, how often you come across it in nature. Um, so that's a zero point, for the sake of like, making this easier. I'm just going to go to 0 0.99. So 99% is atomic mass of 12. And then I'll add that to 13, which has an abundance of 1%. So that's 0 0.01. Um, I do the math on that. You can pop it in your calculator and you'll get 12.01, right? Makes sense. Um, so that's where you get this average atomic mass number. And if you look in a periodic table, you can look at our periodic table. We can see I don't know if we got the right number. Uh, zoom in, zoom in. I see 12.0107. Okay, so if I rounded, then I would get the same number. So that is how you figure out the average atomic mass, and that's why those numbers are decimals, because of the isotopes and how often they occur. Anyways, so that's all fine and exciting, um, but the part that I think is most exciting is this idea of radioactive isotopes. Um, and that's where uh, there's a lot of useful applications. So when something is radioactive, maybe you've heard that song, radioactive something, something, I can't sing it, I don't know. Um, when something is radioactive, it means that it decays or breaks down or changes. Um, there's a couple of different ways that things can decay, but you can think about it as a change um, in the uh, nuclei, and it happens spontaneously. And what that means for something to happen spontaneously is that it doesn't necessarily need anything to like make it happen. It just kind of happens by itself. Spontaneous. If you you know if you spontaneously do your homework, then no one has to remind you to do your homework. You just kind of do it, right? So if something is radioactive, if it's decaying spontaneously, then it just kind of decays. It just goes through that process. Um, and as it decays spontaneously, um, they oftentimes release particles or like little pieces um, or little parts and energy. And both of those things are useful because they can be measured, right? So this release of energy or this release of particles can be measured and that is where there are very useful applications for isotopes. And I will tell you about them, I believe, on the next slide. So, no, no, not there. Let's go there. Doop, 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 doop. Here we are. So, um, they're very useful in biology for um, figuring out how old stuff is. So, in particular, carbon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That is a too thick marker for my taste. Um, carbon 14 can be used for dating things that. Um, aren't too old, but like dating living, like living, formerly living organisms. So like if uh, we find some fossils or if we find some ancient bones, um, we can use carbon-14 to figure out how old they are because we can measure the amount of 14 in material. Um, and I'm not going to go into depth about that, but I can post a link to a video that ex ex explains it, or I can explain it to you in class at some point, too. Um, another thing that isotopes can be useful for is to trace an atom. 
um, in some kind of pathway, in some kind of metabolic pathway in, in an organism, um, in a cell, um, in the, you know, in your uh, physiological systems in your body. Um, and I think the next slide I will go over an example of how that can be used. Um, and the other way it can be used is for diagnosing disorders. Um, so we can use PET scans to measure activity in a particular area um, because we can measure, again, the, these radioactive isotopes. That's a big takeaway here, that radioactive isotopes can be measured, right? Otherwise, it's sometimes kind of hard to know that a particular atom or a particular element is somewhere because they don't really, like, they don't tell you. It's not like they're like, hey, dude, I'm a carbon atom over here. Um, but if you have a carbon-14 somewhere integrated into an organism, then we have ways that, like, well, that we can measure it, right? So it's as if it's, like, waving its arm and being like, I'm here, I'm a carbon-14 atom. And that is really useful in science. So, enough of my anthropomorphizations of things. <laughs> um, so, here um, in the textbook, they talked about uh, an example of an experiment that could be done using radioactive uh, hydrogen. So, I'm going to briefly... Uh, go over what they did here. Actually, I think I like blue stuff. So, in this experiment, the question at hand was what, oops, what temperature is best for, sorry for the handwriting, making DNA? And hopefully, you remember that DNA is made in cells, and they're looking specifically at human cells. And they wanted to know, is it best for cells to make DNA at 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius, or something in between, right? So they take their Petri dish, and this is a Petri dish right here. Um, it's a special little dish plate thingy, bowl maybe, no, it's like a shallow plate bowl thing, I don't know. Um, <laughs> that you can grow all kinds of things on, but for example, cells, um, human cells, right? And so they have to have very specific conditions. They need to have all the um, chemicals that they need, the right um, solutions around them, the right temperature to survive. But, you know, that all aside, assume your cells are alive and they're living in this dish. Um, and what scientists did is they added some chemicals there that would be needed by those cells to make DNA, right? Because when they're making DNA, the cells are going to be taking in various chemicals um, to build their DNA. And what they did was they put in chemicals that contained radioactive hydrogen, hydrogen isotope, uh, hydrogen isotope um, that has a mass number of three. And this hydrogen can be measured, right? Um, and so if these cells are making DNA, so if making DNA, they're going to use some of this material that's put around them, right? They're going to use some of these chemicals, um, and that means that they're going to be using this isotope of hydrogen. So... Scientists added the chemicals, and then they put the petri dishes in their respective temperatures, some in 10 degrees, some in 15, some 20, some 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, right? They put them in there, let them do their thing. I don't know how long it was for, a couple hours, a couple days, doesn't matter. Um, but after some amount of time, they take them out, they rinse them off, right? They clean off so they don't have any extra material around them and then they can measure how much of this hydrogen isotope is in the cells, how much of it is still there, right? Because if it's, th if it's still there, that means it's become part of the DNA of the cell because the cell is constantly um, making copies of that DNA, right? So the DNA of the cell has this isotope in it if it was made during this time, right? So if the cell is not able to make DNA, maybe the temperature is too hot or too cold, 
then we won't see a lot of this isotope, right? But if it is, then we should see some greater amount of it, right? Um, and so if we look at the next slide, which you saw in your reading, um, no, that's not what I want to do. You know, we can, we can make a graph of what we see, right? So here we have it at 10 degrees Celsius. Um, there was very little counts of this hydrogen isotope, right? At 15 degrees, maybe there's a little bit more, 20 degrees, maybe a little bit less, but they're all like really low. And it's not until 25 degrees, 30, 35, we see an increase, right? At 40, there starts to be less, right? So again, um, as we get to high temperatures, um, less DNA was made. But there is a point when there is the most DNA made, right? Um, because we can measure it with this isotope, and so then we can say the optimum, the ideal, the best uh, temperature for making DNA, for DNA synthesis, that's a word uh, to describe the making of DNA, would be right around 35 degrees Celsius, which makes sense because a human body should be right around 37 degrees Celsius, um, and one might imagine that your own body temperature as a human is the ideal temperature for making DNA. Uh, so this experiment confirmed that. And you can use uh, these isotopes to measure that. Pretty cool. Science. Um, so that's all I had to say about isotopes. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, electrons because so far all this stuff has been protons, neutrons, and now we're gonna focus in on electrons and talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm gonna play you this video, it's really kind of corny, um, but hopefully you can bear with me in watching it. Um, it's a Bill Nye video and it gives you a visual representation of what an atom would actually look like if it was human sized, um, where in the sense that how big the nucleus would be compared to how far away the electrons are, and I think it's kind of useful. And there it goes. Take a look right, at let's this. go full screen. It's our proper proportion giant atom model of science. Now, this part isn't very giant. That's because it's just the nucleus, the middle of an atom. Now, in here are two kinds of particles, protons, protons and, and neutrons. neutrons. No one knows what they would really look like. The protons have a positive electrical charge, like a spark. And the neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. They just hang out in the nucleus. Now, buzzing around the outside of the nucleus are very small particles called electrons. Maybe you've heard of them. In fact, the flow of electrons from one atom to another is called electricity. If this vibrating buzzing ball is the nucleus of an atom, how far away do you think the electron would be? Well, as far as you could jump? No. As far as you could throw a ball? Uh-uh. As far as you could run? Well, yeah. Take a look. You can see it from here. It's way out there. It's kind of peachy. Worth it, though. from the nucleus. So, everything that's made of atoms, everything that you can touch and feel, is mostly empty space. Empty space. Empty space. Empty space! Now, the electron weighs, oh, a 10,000 of those particles in the middle. And it's... Right, so... Atoms are mostly empty space, right? So it's if it was the size of a human, uh, or like if it was life size, if our if our nucleus was about this big, then the electrons would be about um, 500 meters away, right? So half a kilometer, um, and that's a that's a distance. Anyways, uh, so yeah, keep in mind that they're mostly empty space, and so when elements or when atoms interact with one another, 
Um, although their, their nuclei are important, it's actually the electrons that do those interactions. So it's the position and it's the distribution of those electrons that affect how your atom or how your particular element will act, will react um, to another one. So it's really important to know about how the electrons are distributed. So if we um, take a moment to think about this, uh, so when you think about el electrons, we think about energy levels, right? Um, and depending on how the electrons are distributed or how they are positioned around our nucleus, so if this is our nucleus and we have our, our rings or our levels of electrons, depending on their the location of those uh, electrons, the atom has different amounts of potential energy. And potential energy is just the energy that matter can have. Um, I feel like I have a spelling error there. Anyways, the amount of energy that um, matter can have, let's do it that way, um, because of location or structure, right? So it has a certain amount of potential energy because of the position of its electrons. Um, and in general, matter has a tendency or will readily or easily want to move to the lowest possible energy level. Um, I sometimes say that uh, in chemistry, uh, atoms are really lazy. They always want everything as little energy requiring as possible. Um, and maybe that's a bit of a simplification, but I, I think it helps remember that everything is trying to be in the lowest possible state of potential energy. Um, and so electrons want to be in the lowest possible energy state, and the further um, they are away from the elect away from the neutron, from the nucleus, um, the greater potential energy they have. Right. So it needs more energy to go further away. If it's closer uh, to the nucleus, it um, has a lower potential potential energy. And so when we think about electrons, um, we can think about them moving, right? Because they, they are, they're always in motion. They are always moving around somewhere. Um, and they can move further away from the atom or they can move closer to it, depending on how much energy they have. Um, and so if electrons move further away from a nucleus, energy must be absorbed by the atom. So you have to put energy into the atom in order to move the electrons further away. So it's absorbed by the atom, right? So you can heat something up and that would provide the energy for electrons to move further away. If the electrons move towards a nucleus for whatever reason, energy is released, right? Um, and you have this diagram here. So if an electron is moving from this lower energy state to this higher potential ener energy state, energy must be absorbed. And if an electron is moving from further away, closer to the atomic nucleus, energy is lost to the environment. And you a lot of times see that as heat, you might see that as light as well, um, and these are all manifestations of energy. So um, we can take a look at the distribution of electrons, right? And you've been learning about this a little bit in class right now. Um, the way that a chemical will act, a particular, an atom of a, a particular um, element will act is determined by the distribution of their electrons. So where their electrons are positioned um, is what will determine their chemical behavior, right? So for example, um, we have hydrogen and it has just one electron and it's in the lowest energy level, right? It wants to be at that lowest potential energy level um, and so it's in this kind of first ring. We have helium has two electrons, again, lowest potential energy level. Um, so we have two electrons in this first ring. If we go to the next row, um, that's when the second shell starts to be filled in with electrons. Um, and that has to do with the fact that the first, this first um, energy level is a particular type of um, electron shell, and it has a maximum of two electrons that can fit into it. Um, so as soon as that gets full, if an atom has another electron, it has to go to the next level, right? And we can see that filling up as we go from the left of the table to the right. There's always one more electron and it's gradually filling up this second energy level. Uh, and 
you learn that these these shells, as we call them, or levels, actually can be subdivided into subshells, um, and that's what's up next, and we'll talk about that then. Um, but what I want to talk about right now is valence electrons, and you guys have spent quite a bit of time talking about valence electrons in chemistry, so this will be very brief, but remember that the valence electrons are the outer most electrons, right? So these are the electrons that are on the outside shell, and I can highlight those in red. So for hydrogen, it only has one. For helium, it only has two, so it has those. It's not a very good job of outlining them. Maybe I can use a thicker um, Lithium has one. Beryllium has two. Boron has three. Come on. Right? We have carbon has four. Yeah. Uh, nitrogen has its five, and oxygen has six. This is so much harder than I thought it would be. Oh my goodness, seven um, for fluorine, right? Uh, and you'll notice that they're increasing by one, and you'll also remember that uh, neon has eight. Um, you also remember that the group number corresponds to the number of valence electrons, right? So at least for the main group elements. So group 1A has one valence electron, group 2A has two valence electrons, group 3A has uh, three, group 4A has four, etc. right? Um, and you might be saying, but wait, miss, that's not the table I remember. And it's true. Uh, it's not because uh, right here, they cut out all the transition metals, right? So this is just these kind of first um, set of elements that we like to talk about, and we call these the main group elements sometimes. Uh, and we're going to focus on them a little bit, but we'll also talk about the transition metals later. Um, yeah, so the valence electrons are really important because, as you might imagine, because when something reacts, it's the electrons interacting. The electrons that are on the most outside are going to be the ones that matter the most, right? So the valence electrons are the ones that are especially important for determining um, chemical behavior of a particular atom. So it's really important that you guys are comfortable thinking about the number of valence electrons um, and what they're doing. I think that's all I want to say here. So let's talk about uh, subshells. So if we're looking at neon here, neon has 10 electrons, right? It has 10 protons and has 10 electrons. And it has two electrons in this first level, in this first shell, and it has eight in the next shell. But it turns out that that second shell is actually divided into two subshells. And what we talk about when we talk about these subshells is the types of orbitals they are, the ways that those electrons are distributed. They're actually not in rings, they're in different shapes besides rings. So, if we draw this electron diagram for neon, if we look at this orbital, uh, the different orbitals that it has, when we have our neon, so we have our nucleus in the middle, the first shell is an s orbital, right? And we call that the 1s orbital. And it has our first two electrons. That makes sense. Then we have our next s orbital, um, and we call that one the 2s because it's the second one, right? So an s means that it's this kind of like circular, spherical um, orbital. But those first two electrons fill in there, that's true, but then the next um, three, right, because remember we have two and then we have eight, then, so two of these are in the s orbital, but then the next um, six of them, did I say three, I meant six, um, are in these like funny kind of like, I don't know, like figure eight like orbital, right? And each of those have two electrons. Um, and this diagram that I'm making is absolutely hideous. Uh, but you see it here, right? So we have the 1s, 2s, and then it, you have all of the the p orbitals. I think by drawing that I made it more confusing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I don't think that you need to know these into too much detail, but you need to know that there are different types of orbitals 
uh, that electrons can be in, and they can either be in spherical orbitals or they can be in these kind of figure eight shapes, um, uh, and those are called p orbitals, and there's also d orbitals and f orbitals, and I don't think that you necessarily need to know them. Um, maybe we'll, we'll um, come back to them if we need to study them more. So the takeaway here is that the electrons are organized into specific levels or shells, and those have orbitals. So it's always a little bit more complicated than you think that it is. So one um, diagram that I found really useful to think about how the electrons fill in in these orbitals is this one that comes from uh, a chemistry textbook called Living by Chemistry. And it kind of helps you know how these electrons fill in these shells because they start at the lowest level and then they gradually they fill into higher levels. And so you start out with a 1s uh, orbital, right? That's that first one. And once that one fills in, so you have your first electron and you have your second electron, it goes to a 2s orbital, right? So then you have your third electron, you have your fourth electron. Once that is filled in, that's when you go to a p orbital. And we call that the 2p, not the 1p, because it's in the second row of the periodic table, right? Um, and so that p orbital has a maximum of six electrons, so we have our fourth, we have our fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth um, electron from the beginning, right? But those are six right there, and those are on the p orbital. Then after that, there's another s orbital, um, because that's kind of the way that things just fill in. And I don't really know how to draw that without it like being a total mess. Um, uh, but you, you, can, you can kind of imagine how things go from S to P, and they go back to S, and then to P, and then eventually we get to D orbitals, and then if you make it all the way down to lanthanides and actinides, you get to the F orbitals. And so this kind of shows you how those uh, electrons will fill in as you get more and more electrons around a given atom. And I can show you guys uh, a kind of a memorization technique for how to know uh, the filling in of the electron orbitals. But I don't think that you actually need to know that for this test, so we're not going to worry about it too much. And so uh, that's kind of all that we have to talk about in terms of atomic structure. The next part that we're going to talk about is about chemical bonds. Um, and uh, But before we do that, I want to give you a few questions. So as always with these questions, um, try to answer them yourself. So pause the video, grab a piece of paper, go talk to someone, whatever works best for you, um, and try to answer them. So I'd recommend pausing the video now because I'm going to start giving you the answers. So um, here we have a nitrogen atom and it has seven protons uh, and it has seven neutrons, right? And so its mass number would be seven and seven, which would give us 14, right? And it has seven protons, and its atomic mass um, would also be uh, 14, um, but it would be a decimal, right? So I could use my period periodic table to look up exactly what the atomic mass is, but it would be about 14 atomic mass units or Daltons. Something like that, right? And our mass number would also be 14 Daltons or atomic mass unit number, no, atomic mass units. Um, then uh, we have our next question. What is our next question? So we have electrons, and they're at a particular energy level, right? And I'm asking you, what happens if the atom that we're talking about here absorbs enough energy, what could possibly happen if it's absorbing energy, right? Um, so take a moment to read through your possible options, choose the best option, make sure you understand your choice, um, and then you can start the video again. So as you read through these options, um, the first one is that electron may move away from an atom, from an electron shell, uh, so they might move further away from the nucleus. That seems like a reasonable choice, but you should always read through your other options before you commit to anything. Um, 
So the other option is an electron may move to and the electron shell closer to the nucleus. An electron may move to and I think there's this must be a typo. An electron may move to an electron shell closer to the nucleus. Mm. Oh, now I get it. Um, this should say to another electron shell closer to the nucleus. Um, so if it has more energy, is it going to move closer to the nucleus or further away? Definitely not closer, right? So we know that that's not right. Um, will the atom become positively charged as an ion if it absorbs energy? Well, I mean, it's unlikely that that's what's going to happen because we know that an ion forms when there is an imbalance of charge. Um, so we know that that's not what's going to happen. It's definitely not going to become a radioactive isotope. Um, and whether it will become a negatively charged ion is also unlikely um, because we're talking about absorbing energy and not gaining or losing electrons. So it turns out that first option definitely was the best option, but it's always good to check the other ones before you commit. And I think that is my last slide. Um, so that's... That's 2.2, .2, uh, and we will talk more about bonds in the next video. So good luck studying, and uh, talk to you soon.